Well, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the SBDC in our um, this morning's webinar. We we thank you for for joining us. We think we've got um, a um, a good informational uh, program for you on SBIRs and especially how to how to leverage some money during you know during this um, during this um, uh, COVID um, crisis. Um, Donna, do you want to talk a little bit about how we're the, some of the housekeeping? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're just going to give everybody a few minutes to get in. It's not at quite nine o'clock yet. Okay. Um, but welcome to our webinar. We have Lou Farina, who's a business analyst with the Maricopa SBDC, and Bob Mucci, who is uh, working with the uh, PTAC office that are going to be presenting today. We do have a Q&A box that if you have any questions for either Lou or Bob, if you would type them in the Q&A box and we will be answering those questions throughout the presentation. Um, please don't use the chat because they tend to get lost in uh, questions there. If you do have a, you know, a technical issue or something, go ahead and use the chat, but for your questions and answers, please use that box and we'll go ahead and, and read those off as they come in. Um, we're still gonna, we'll wait just a few more seconds, I guess, for people to, to arrive and we are recording this. We will send out the link to all the uh, participants as well as the people who are not able to attend. We'll send that out as soon as it is posted on our website and you can refer to that uh, in the future. So if you, um, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thanks, okay. Lou. Okay, great. So thank you, Donna. Yeah, everybody. So yeah, as Donna said, feel free to um, put those uh, questions in um, as we um, as we go through the slides, we're going to be shifting gears from topic to topic, and I don't want to lose some of those questions. So um, please feel free to, uh, to to interrupt us. Um, so you know, anybody who's done some fundraising, um, whether it's now or in the pandemic during the last year, you can you know it's extremely challenging. Um, and the SBIR, SBIR STTR program is really um, the nation's largest source of early stage high risk funding for startups and small businesses. And um, it's a really, really a great opportunity for early stage funding. Uh, and we'll talk to you a little, we're gonna talk in detail about this particular program today. So the topics for today, I wanted to start with just the, the startup capital landscape, you know, raising money. It just how how where the SBIRs fit in in the whole landscape and in the sequence. Then I'm going to give you the uh, an introduction to the SBIR STTR program, um, and then I'm we're going to shift and talk specifically about the the importance of the commercialization plan because it's a, that's a real vital part of an SBIR, which is very different than other research type of grants. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the resources that are available to you. So again, my name is Lou Farina. I am a business analyst here at the Maricopa uh, SBDC Center. I, uh, my specialty is in commercialization. I've been here a couple of years. My background is um, in technology, um, corporate ventures, investing in uh, different uh, technology companies, acquisitions, uh, starting new businesses. I was an angel investor here in town for a while. Um, I, I'm actually a, now an official reviewer uh, for the um, SBIR reviewer for the National Science Foundation. And also on the call with us, uh, we have Bob Mucci. Bob works for our PTAC Center. He is really, really knowledgeable in SBIRs, SCTRs, and I'll let him introduce himself. Um, thanks, Lou. My name's Bob Mucci, and I'm a procurement specialist with Arizona PTAC. We're, um, we do things very similar to the SBDC, except we specialize in government procurement. And I'm the designated subject matter expert um, with Arizona PTAC for SBIRs. I work with the University of Arizona um, Center for Innovation and also Gateway Community College Center for Not Entrepreneurial Innovation um, in assisting clients to applying to the SBIR process. I used to be an SBDC counselor, and now I'm just strictly an Arizona Procurement Technical Assistance Center counselor. Terrific, thanks, Bob. We're really, really thankful to have you here to, to add to this um, webinar. Um, I, so up front here, before we get started, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna give you a little bit of a commercial for the SBDC. So the Maricopa SBDC is part of an, an America's SBDC network Arizona network. So there's an Arizona network. It's 10 different centers in Arizona. Um, we are the Maricopa Center. 
and there are 17 counselors in the Maricopa Center. We serve Maricopa County. Primarily what we do is counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling. So that's um, the client and the counselor getting together in the, in the, in the context of an SBIR, it would be most likely to review um, your, um, your submission prior to submitting your proposal. Um, we do training. This is an example of training. There's lots of other webinars um, that we are, have done in the last year. When we go back to things um, you know, being a little bit more normal, we'll be, we'll be doing it in person. And then we provide other type of resources, um, market research services and some other tools and resources. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, some of the technical assistance areas, you know, we've, we, we do have, we do do some specialization. We've got, um, you know, you know, it's top of the list, it's disaster loan assistance. A year ago at this time, that was on the bottom of the list. Um, but, you know, that, that's been a big part, at least the last year. Um, and we do a lot of lender readiness preparation. Um, you know, uh, businesses that need loans, they come to us uh, to help them prepare for a loan package. Uh, we do financial reviews. We have marketing specialists. We have some specialists in buying and selling um, businesses with exits. We have specialists in manufacturing, technology commercialization. We have a couple of specialists in export and international trade. And again, um, government contracting through our PTAC organization. Uh, here's just uh, this is a very busy slide and you, I don't think you'll be able to read all of it, but it, um, it, these are just a sample of some of the tools that we have available um, to our, our SBDC clients at no, uh, at no charge. Uh, one is Growth Wheel. That's a full a holistic assessment of your business, helping you make some decisions in, 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 in um, specific areas. We've got Live Plan. Um, Live Plan is um, a, uh, a business case development platform. Um, and the, both of these are commercial platforms. We don't own these. These are external tools, but they're free through us. Um, we've got something called Pro uh, Profit Sense. Profit Sense is a financial analysis tool. We can, we can take your financials and put them in and compare them to similar companies um, and uh, benchmark you. Uh, the data set is called SageWorks. That's a pretty common SageWork uh, data set that's used in a lot of different tools. Um, there's IBIS World, which is a market research service. And this is really especially important to anybody doing um, uh, business plans or even SBIRs, commercialization plans. You need to have some third-party market research. Um, that this is available. These reports are available through us at no cost. Um, you know, on the street, they're about fifteen hundred dollars a piece. Again, we can provide multiple um, reports to you at no cost, and there again, it's really valuable as you as you build out your business plan. And then there's SBDCnet.org, which is um, more of a custom research service. And I'll turn it over to Bob to tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, the PTAC assistance areas. Thanks, Lou. So Arizona PTAC um, provides, like, like I previously said, similar services to the SBDC, but we're restricted because we're uh, paid for with a grant through the Defense Logistics Agency to government contracting and government procurement. We cannot assist clients with starting their businesses or startup phases of their businesses. You need to be um, you know, registered as a business or a sole proprietor um, before we can assist you. And all of our consulting work is the exact same as SBDC. There's no charge um, to what it is we do. All of our consulting work is confidential. And I have signed NDAs for clients who are doing SBIR work so that it gives them some level of uh, confidence that what they're talking to me, um, I can't reveal to anybody else. We can also help with registration in all the required databases for SBIRs. Uh, that includes getting your DUNS number, getting into the system for award management, uh, SBA business registration. We can assist you in researching the appropriateness of your application for a specific topic in a specific agency, because there's a lot of agencies that do SBIRs, and they are all different. Um, we can review your application for complete list, complete listness, assist with budget preparation, project management guidance but we will not write your application for you. That is something that you know we feel is best done by you, the applicant, um, because obviously we span a lot of, lot of technical areas and I don't have that technical expertise to you know, write your application, but I will review it for you. And also like SBDC, 
you can, you know, um, reach us or get registered. And I didn't put this up, but it's at azptac.com. And you would register the exact same way that you would go through the SBDC registration. Um, we do require you to be registered um, as a client before we can provide assistance to you. So that in a, is in a nutshell is what we do. Um, go ahead and the next slide. So okay. we've, the applications that I've worked on in the past <clears throat> have been, you know, span actually a large number of um, different application portals. I've done National Science Foundation applications, NIH applications, uh, Department of the Air Force, Air Force Works program, which is a program that I really like. Um, I just had a client get a phase one award through the Air Force Works program. Um, I've done SBIRs to the Army, Department of Energy, and Department of Navy. Department of Energy applications are the most complex um, and require the most amount of work. So I have a broad experience doing SBIRs to a variety of agencies. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit. And we, we're, we, um, we'd like to know who, who's in our audience and kind of where you are um, uh, with respect to SBIRs or STTRs. And yeah, Donna's putting up a poll. And if you would answer for us, it would give us just a little context um, and how to maybe to, to, to tailor our presentation a little bit. And here's the awkward silence. I'm gonna leave this up for about 30 more seconds to give everybody a chance to put in their answer. So Lou, you can see these results, right? I can see the poll. Okay, um, so as soon as we're done, um, I will go ahead and read you off the results. Gonna be about uh, 10 more seconds to get your answer in. Okay, we're gonna end the poll in three, two, one. Okay, so Lou, there's a 11 who have not applied. So that's 79% of our registrants. Uh, one person is currently writing their proposal and two people have been awarded uh, a phase two. Oh, there you go, there, I see it now. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got, wow, we've got a couple phase two winners and um, some folks that are just getting into it. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, so let, you know, before, before we start, let me talk a little bit about what we won't be able to cover today. SBIR, STDR program is a vast program. Um, and there's a, there's a lot to it. And we've only got an hour and a half or so, and we're gonna try to hit some of the highlights for you. Um, but what we won't be able to do today is, it's, it's not, this is not a proposal writing workshop, right? There are proposal writing workshops that are put on from time to time by different entities. It's something we just don't have time to do today, or nor do I actually have the skill to, to uh, to, to, to lead you in that area. We won't be able to provide you provo proposal samples. Um, we're not gonna give you the registration process details. We're not gonna walk you through registration. Um, that's something that you can do on your own or with the, with the, uh, with the assistance of PTAC uh, at a later date. Um, you know, we'll talk about the granting organizations, but we can't give you the specifics of each granting organization. As Bob pointed out, they're all different. And that adds, so there's one SBIR, STTR program, and then there's 11 different agencies who kind of tailor their program to each of the granting age, to each of their agencies. And so it's all a little bit different. Um, one of the things people always ask is for an overall schedule of solicitations for the different agencies. And because there are so many different ones and they, and they vary, um, it's really impossible to, for anybody to, to get their arms around it. Um, and then we're not going to really go through in detail solicitation searches, although I will we'll show you how you can start to, 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 um, to search for solicitations. You know, that's stuff we won't be able to cover. We're going to be able to cover a lot of good information. So let's just talk about um, the first subject, which is startup capital. And um, how, do you, how do you fund a startup, an early stage technology company, right? So there's really two ways to do it. 
there's debt capital or there's equity. Debt means a loan that needs to be paid back, but there's no ownership. Equity capital means that there's an investor or a company or, or some kind of corporate entity that's investing um, and they are gonna take some, some ownership and expect uh, a return. So they're gonna participate in your success. You know, um, anybody who's, who's done this before, the first startup capital, the first money in, the early stage, it's the trickiest and the most difficult. Um, you spend a lot of time here. Um, there's stiff competition for limited resources of financing, um, both in debt and in equity. Um, now, you, you've, we've all heard stories about um, entrepreneurs that walk into a venture capital firm with a couple of slides and walk out with $5 million, right? And they, they, tip, they typically get published and people use them as examples. But, you know, the real, the, realistically, that's not the way it works. It works well if you're a serial entrepreneur and you've had a successful exit or two, which means you've built a company and you've sold it at a massive profit and you've put money in investors' pockets before. Um, and then you have also have a close network of investors eager to fund. It's going to be a lot easier for you. you know. And um, unfortunately, most of us are not in that boat. So we have to work really, really hard for startup capital. Let's just talk about debt real quick. So. Um, you know, the sad fact is that banks typically won't lend startup businesses that don't have two to three years worth of financial statements and some owner's equity. So they're looking for existing businesses, uh, even early stage, but they, you know, have to have some traction and some financials typically. Um, and it's, so it's not really an avenue for most startups. If you were to go down that route, it's a 7A, SBA 7A loan um, to, to do that. To do a loan, you need a business plan, you need a cost expense worksheet, you need your financial projections for the next five years, typically. You'll, you'll need 15 to 25% of equity, infu equity infusion, that's your down payment. They'll reach back for a personal guarantee. Um, so you, you'll pierce the, you know, the veil of your corporation and get to your personal assets with collateralization. Now let's just talk about the investment uh, equity investment progression. And you'll see different stages. And you know these are all depending on what term and who you talk to, everybody's got different, different nomenclature. But you know, in the idea stage, the first money in, we always you know, talk about who's the first money into a business, it's yourself. You've got to put money in. Who's the second money in? Yourself. And so the emphasis is on self. So really what, what, we're, what, we, tell, what we tell clients and we tell potential um, businesses who want investment is nobody, there's no investor that's the first money in, okay? They, they always gonna follow some money and they wanna follow, they wanna see that you've got, and we use this term a lot, skin in the game. So um, that's really, really important. You know, next in the pre-seed, you know, after you put some money in yourself, you get things going, there's, there's, some, there's some other opportunities, right? There's friends, and we often refer people to a friends and family round. Go, go talk to your uncles, your, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, people who love you and, and, and want to see you succeed, maybe aren't as interested in the return and willing to take a, a lot of risk. There's public sources, right? You know, the Arizona Innovation Challenge, for instance, at the state level. There's potential crowdfunding. There are accelerators that may give you some kind of um, some kind of uh, uh, stipend uh, or award or um, or prize even for contests. And then there are grants and mostly SBIRs here up front. So SBIR is a is it actually is a lot of money very very early relative to other sources of funding. Now after you've gone through you know the the idea and the pre seed and you've got some some traction. Um, you can start to talk to investors, right? Angel investors. Angel investors are typically um, sophisticated uh, individuals who form groups, um, but they are looking for, you know, uh, high returns in a you know, three to five year period. Um, so they're looking for something that scales very, very quick with an exit strategy. Um, strategic investors are a little bit different. They may have some kind of tangential business to yourself, um, they may be in your supply chain, and they may be a little bit more um, willing to uh, to invest in your company for the for maybe some synergy between their company or themselves, and, and maybe have a longer uh, time horizon. Um, and then you talk about corporate venture, uh, 
potentially um, a lot of technology is acquired by by larger corporations. Um, they will they will seed technology, um, and I, I again I used to do this as as for a living. Um, but usually, I mean, they're 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 kind of downstream, right? They're they're usually coming in after after angels have come in, after strategic investors have come in, and, and typically before venture capital has come in, but some but sometimes after. And so venture capital, again, is farther downstream. And then you get to IPOs and private equity firms, which, which um, deal in very large, large uh, sums of money. So that's the, that's the progression typically. Um, and again, just pointing out SBIR is very early and it's a, it's a good chunk of change. So why do investors like SBIRs? So it's, again, it's early. It's an early capital injection really nice to have um, someone else put some money in besides themselves and not only did somebody put some money in it's non-dilutive capital right that word non-dilutive means nobody owns it so now you know now the 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 ownership is really with the proprietor or the or the founding team there's no dilution at all um there is a certain level of validation that comes along with getting an sbir right there's some scientific vetting these agencies and there's a commercialization vetting and so um, and that's good. And that, and that works in your favor. It also de-risks the investment. Like as an investor, you're looking at risk. Money that goes in that's productive early de-risks the investment. So now it's a less risk by the time it gets to me as maybe as a potential angel investor or strategic investor. But I will tell you on the other, on the flip side, simply receiving uh, an SBIR grant does not mean the company is a good investment from an investor's perspective, right? It's always a good thing if you got a phase one, it's even a better if you've got a phase two, really like it, but it just doesn't mean that money's gonna come raining down on you uh, from an investment perspective. You know, these agencies are, um, are, are, are not venture capital, they're not professional investors. So their level of validation and vetting is not nearly as sophisticated as um, you would find in in the uh, in the private markets. So that, that's that's it on just kind of where it sits. Here here we're going to get into the SBIR STTR program. Um, I'm gonna I may just say SBIR program at times. I mean STTR. They're kind of combined. There's some differences. I'll talk about the differences. But these next set of slides, 10 slides or so, is really kind of some of the very basic things that you'll find in a lot of these um, SBIR, STTR presentations. If you've said anything from you know, the SBA or any other organizations, you'll probably recognize some of these slides. Okay, so what is the program goal? Stimulate technology innovation, uh, meets the federal research and development needs. It fosters and encourages participation and innovation and entrepreneurship by socially and economically disadvantaged persons. So there is a program element for that. Um, and increases private sector commercialization of innovations derived from the federal research and development funding. So this is, you know, that, that fourth one is really, really important um, from my perspective. You know, there's a lot of money, uh, federal research money um, from the government that's, that's funded through universities and, and other, uh, other um, different mechanisms. But SBIRs, STTRs are really unique in that they are looking at applied technology, applied research that leads to commercialization. So this is not another science project. This is, this is technology that, that they and you believe can be built, um, uh, can be built out to form a, a, a high functioning business. So when is there not a match? So when is an SBIR, STTR not right for you? And this is important. Um, I've had, you know, I have to have these these conversations either unfortunately or fortunately for my clients, um, you know, before they get too far into it. Um, again, I so applied research only. This is not for marketing. It's not for sales. It's not for manufacturing per se. Um, it's for very um, innovative technology and bringing it forward. Um, it's not for building out a, a software platform for anybody to code. It's not, it's not for that. Um, so it, typically what we say commercialization is not funded. So um, the, one of the elements of the SBIR program is this phase, this concept of phase three, which we'll talk about later is commercialization. And that, that 
means that the, there's other sources of funding is going to be needed to commercialize the technology. So the you know in your in your commercialization plan, and I'll talk about this later. You you don't want to stop um, and say you know after I get a phase two, then I'm going to be a commercial entity. You've got to talk about how you're going to go out and raise additional money um, from the private sector to actually commercialize it. Certainly not for work already completed. Um, this is for new and innovative research. However, if you've got completed work and you've got something, a derivative of that work that new and innovative, um, there's a possibility that you might find a, um, a, a solicitation. Um, and then the other thing is possible, so you might have something that doesn't really align with a participating agency. You go through these solicitations and they're asking for some pretty specific things. Um, you know, and, and the DOD and, and, and some of the other ones, um, they're, they're, they, they really want to procure this technology in the form of a product for, the, by, for themselves. Now, if you shift, you know, the NSF um, is a little bit broader. And so they have broad categories. And typically, if you've got something innovative, you can wedge it into one of their categories. Um, but again, it, you, just because you've got something doesn't mean that it, 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 uh, it aligns. And Luke, can I add something in real quick? Please, go um, ahead, Bob. If a lot of times, if you're uh, doing a SBIR that is through a, a DOD, through one of the DOD entities, the majority of times your client for your um, technology is going to be DOD. And so you get to your phase two and and it's sort of almost the next step is to you know have the government come in and buy whatever it is you know you've been able to produce which is a little different than nsf nih and some of the other agencies so you know that's that's a little wrinkle with with dod that's a bit different yep and we're going to talk about that i've got some slides in that bob but we can okay. give them a little more detail on that well thank you um so again the program a little more on the program uh, it's it's a highly it's highly competitive. I can't say that enough. It's very competitive. Three phase award system, first enacted in 1982. So federal agencies with more than 100 million dollars in extramural external R&D are required to allocate a percentage of their budgets exclusively for small business, and that's for an SBIR. Um, so again, federal agencies with big research budgets need to take a small percentage, and I'll show you the budgets in a little bit, um, and allocate it to a to a fund. Um, benefits, again, of the SBIR program. Again, non-dilutive capital. Just to emphasize, funding agency cannot take an equity position or ownership in the firm. That's, that's great news. There's data rights, IP data rights. Uh, this has been extended, I think, three or four years ago. They extended this to 20 years, um, beginning from the date of award. Um, and then there's, as Bob mentioned, there's direct follow-on phase three awards. And this is, um, this is the certain agencies will actually act as the customer and procure um, without further competition. So um, from a budget perspective, SBIRs are 3.2% of external research budgets. Uh, it, in 19, that was $3.28 billion. I don't have the 20 numbers. Um, STTRs, and there's a difference, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the difference. It's, it's a smaller percentage, um, but it's for um, agencies with budgets greater than a billion dollars a year, and there's $453 million in that pot in, um, in 2019. But combined, there was over 5,000 new awards um, to small businesses each year. So that's, that's quite a bit. The participating agencies, there's 11 here. Um, and these are all, this is for SBIRs, um, Department of Agriculture, Commerce, Defense, Education, Energy, Homeland Security, Transportation, HHS, which includes NIH, the EPA, NASA, and uh, the NSF. So um, the difference between an SBIR and STTR, it's, it's subtle. Um, but um, there are differences in it. So it, one of the big differences is the partnering, right? In SBIRs permit partnering. So you can work with a third party uh, um, nonprofit research organization, I, AKA maybe a, a university. The STTR requires it, okay? So 
is a little bit different. You need to have a partner for an STTR. SBI, you don't need to have a partner. However, I will say my, from my experience, um, having a partner for an SBIR with a university and a high profile researcher actually really works uh, to your favor. So not necessarily um, um, required, but highly, I highly encourage it. Bob, anything, do you have anything on that? No, same thing. And I'm, I'm the exact same, you know, um, position that if you if you have a partner through university, even on an SBIR, it, you know, ups your chances of getting an award, particularly if it's, you know, a university that has a lot of experience with SBIRs or your research partner, say you're, you know, the doctoral person that you're working with has gotten awards in the past, it, it ups your chances of getting an award. Yep, absolutely. So Lou, uh, excuse me, we do have one question that Evelyn just uh, posed. She said she's working on a new patentable product that she needs to test biomechanically. Can any of the costs of the patent be included in the proposal? No, no, that's not my experience. The cost of the patent usually cannot be included in the proposal. Okay, okay thank you. Um, on the principal investigator, which is the primary person on the grant, um, for an SBIR, it, it must be within the small business and the employment must be greater than 50% of their time. Um, for the STTR, the, the principal investigator can be in, employed either by the research institution or the partner. It, the, I'm sorry, the research institution partner or the small business, and you need to check the solicitation. It'll, it'll be very specific. Uh, there's some differences in subcontracting, um, for um, work requirements. Um, all 11 agencies uh, uh, eight, uh, um, have SBIRs. There's only five agencies that actually do STTRs. The five agencies that do STTRs also do SBIRs. So of the 11, five, just, five also include STTRs. Uh, here's the budget. So this is the combined budget for SBIRs, STTRs in 2019. And you just, this gives you just an idea of how, who's spending money, you know? Um, DOD, by far the biggest. Um, HHS, including NIH, um, very large. DOE, National Science Foundation, NASA, also very large. And then everybody else. So um, these typically are the ones we have the most experience with. Um, although I do have a client or two that did, you know, have some, uh, have uh, gotten awards through, uh, through some of the other agencies. So there's a difference and in, in, um, it's a subtle difference here. We talk about an SBIR or an STTR being a grant and that's a general term, but really there's, there's a difference between a grant and a, and a contract. And some of the agencies actually are grants provide grants and some of the agency actually, they're actually research contracts. And there's a difference. And the difference is in a lot of times in the requirements. So in a, in a contract, um, you know, you'll get, you'll get, uh, you'll invoice on progress. There'll be highly focused topics. Um, there's plans, protocols, requirements, schedules that you'll have to meet. It's a binding agreement between a buyer and a seller um, for, this, for this research. And the ones who usually contract uh, uh, DOD uh, and NASA, EPA, you'll see, you see what's listed there in the bottom. The contracting agencies also typically tend to be the procuring agencies um, on the phase three. So they, they'll contract you for the research, hoping that they'll be able to procure this, this um, piece of technology um, by the time you're, you're through your phase two or into your phase three. Now in a granting agency and you know, um, NSF and DOE are the kind of the big ones there. Um, you know, the principal investigator initiates the approach. There's specific topics. Um, there's an assistance mechanism for you. There's a, some, there's a lot more flexibility. There's an upfront payment. And, you know, so like for instance, NSF, they don't buy anything, right? They're, they're just, it's really funding to support the public purpose, best effort and research. A lot of times, um, you know, they're a little bit loose on you know, what you say you're gonna do. You get into the research, turns into something else. And that's typically okay. You know, you just kind of follow the natural path of, of the research. Um, the bottom here, note, footnote, HHS and NIH are mostly grants, but there are some, I guess there are some contracts for some solicitations. So um, the, the, the way it works 
it, 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 solicitation, you typically find the solicitation. Before this, you have to register, of course. You find the solicitation. Um, you write your proposal. You submit your proposal. The proposal is evaluated. And then there's an award for phase one. Um, typically, for phase two, you don't follow this because uh, phase two, you have to have phase one. Um, and you're invited for phase two. Um, the three phases, again, uh, and, and this is kind of, this is not my slide. Again, I, I, I lifted this from one of the presentations that I saw, but um, the, the first, a phase one is really discovery. It's really feasibility and proof of concept, right? So the budget guide 150 to 250, I think it's up to right 265 now, Bob, for some of the agencies. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so in the period for an SBIR is six months, uh, STTR, it's a year. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's proof of concept. So if you're trying to get a phase one um, and, you're, and, you, and you, your proposal says you're gonna build out this entire product, it's usually not, not the right approach, right? You have to show it's, you're taking a research and you're, you're, um, you're um, doing a feasibility study. So you know, the second phase is development. You start to get into more of the applied development and it's um, you know, go, taking your research and actually building out a pro prototype. And the budget guide here is about a million dollars, um, plus or minus. I know there are some that are 500,000. I think Air Force is 500,000. And then I know NSF can go up to, I think uh, 1.25 million or so. Um, the project period's longer. It's, uh, it's two years for an SBIR and STTR. And then the commercialization. And again, we talked about this um, in a couple other slides, but um, most of the time for non-granting, for non-contracting agency, the, inve the subsequent investment is needed to achieve commercialization. That's your phase three. So you go to NSF, there's no phase three award. Phase three is you going out, raising money, building this business based on what you, based upon your, your phase two um, product or your prototype. DOD, as Bob mentioned, uh, the phase three is a potential procurement. So it actually becomes a government contract. Is that correct, Bob? Uh huh. That's correct. Um, and sometimes it's also, that's also true with NASA. Um, I had a client that did a NASA project and they liked it so much that halfway through the client's phase two, NASA said, you know, when you're done, we're going to give you a, you know, a, a contract for your work that would be about $25 million. So the other thing too with phase one is phase one for the Air Force Works program is a little bit of a hybrid and that is a flat $50,000 to do your phase one for Air Force Works, but that's a very, very different kind of uh, project uh, that, you know, I can explain to people, um, you know, how it works if they want to get in touch with me. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Um, so registrations. So this is an area I don't spend a lot of time on. Honestly, this is a slide I got again from one of the um, one of the presentation slides. But the three major ones are Duns, SAM, and uh, Company Registry and SBIR.gov. Right, Bob? I think everybody requires those three. Correct. And I want to put a little caveat in here. Supposedly they are going to be getting rid of the Duns process effective this month, and they're going to a universal. Um, design, universal something or other number. Um, we'll see what happens when they do that. You know, my general experience has been for a couple of months, chaos will ensue um, with that. And, and also, this is an area that I do spend a lot of time with my clients on. I mean, I make sure that they hit all of these X's that you've put in here. So that this is an area that I do provide direct assistance to clients on. Terrific. Yeah, that's it's important. Um, so the company requirements, what kind of companies can apply? And this is a general SBA kind of kind of definition. Must be for profit, no nonprofits, U.S. owned and operated, and under 500 people. Work must be done in the U.S. Right. So that's important. Right. You can't farm this. You can't farm your subcontract work out um, out of the U.S. Um, again, focusing on R&D with the intent to commercialize. You typically can't purchase equipment, um, can't commercialize technology that's already developed. I know I'm repeating myself. And they're really not for technologies that are very low risk and only just need capital, right? It's just, it's not just a, 
a way to to build something uh, for with seed capital, right? It's it's generally, high, you know, high risk is because it's high innovation. Um, Bob, do you have any comment on the purchasing of equipment? Can are all of, do all of them uh, prohibit purchasing equipment? No, you know that it depends on the uh, specific you know application. Um, in some cases, you're allowed to purchase you know equipment as long as it's not over five thousand um, dollars. For instance, if you need a laptop or if you need you know you know some you know, some equipment to you know work on your project, but there are dollar amounts that you know um, they limit you to. In other words, you can't go out and buy a hundred million dollar you know particle you know slicing machine. Um, so that so they are. It's, it depends on the it depends on the solicitation, and you do have to you know designate in your budget if you are going to buy equipment exactly what it is you're going to buy. But five thousand dollars is the general rule as the limit uh, to as to what you can buy for any specific piece of equipment. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, and, and the other thing is a small business is always the applicant and the awardee. So it has, it, it, this, these grants and, and contracts or SBIR, this TTRs go to small businesses. And, and Lou, I wanna tell people need to, you know, make sure that when they apply, they are, you know, qualified as a small business. In other words, Raytheon cannot get an SBIR contact, contract. Yep. Um, principal investigator must be employed. We talked about this at the time of the award or the partnering institution as TTR. Um, they should have the appropriate expertise to oversee projects scientifically and technically, right? They should have the credentials as the PI. Um, and the expertise of the PI and team are really one of three evaluation factors. So um, the PI, who, who the PI is, um, is, is really important. Um, here, here's, um, this is how you would search for topics. And um, you, you, you go to www.sbir.gov. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about more about this site and what it offers, but this is how you get to the topic search. Here's the URL down here. You go under funding and current topics and search. And uh, you can search um, by keyword, you can filter by agency. Bob, do you wanna talk? Do you, I know you do a little bit more of this than I do. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about this a little bit? Sure, so, so this is a really very good site to do you know, your initial uh, search. But <clears throat> what I do after this is I go right down into the agencies and look at what the agencies are, are looking for. And one of the really best ways to look at it, specific, uh, specifically for DOD, is what they call broad agency announcements, BAAs. And what will happen is the agency will put out a BAA, which um, will, will list the topics that they're looking for applicants to go ahead and apply for. And certain agencies, the, it, it is topic specific. If you are doing something that is not one of the agency's requested topics, then you know you really can't apply. And there's two exceptions here. Um, actually, yeah, two exceptions. One is NSF, which is really very, very broad topics. Um, and they have specific program directors for each topic. And then, like I said, the Air Force has an Air Force Works program. And in the Air Force Works program, they do have specific topics, but they have open topic. And an open topic, basically they're saying, show us what you got. You know, I mean, it may be, and this is, I had an applicant that just got an award for that. And, you know, it's, it's gotta be something that's related to um, what the Air Force is looking for um, and something that will help the Air Force, you know, uh, uh, you know, be successful in their programs. But, but this is a good place to start. And, you know, like I said, then I delve down right into the specific agency from there. Okay, thanks. Um, and this is just some success stories from, again, uh, this is, I think, an SBA slide, but, you know, some big names. Lots of companies have gone through the SBIR STTR program. You've got Qualcomm, um, 23andMe, uh, Sonicare, Biogen, et cetera, Symantec. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. That's, that's the program, uh, just some real basics. Again, there's a lot more to it. Um, but one of the, the really important points 
um, an SBAR, if I haven't emphasized enough, is commercialization. It's, you know, how are you, what are you going to do to, to turn your um, technology into a business? And so when you talk about commercialization plan, um, every agency has their own term. So you may not see a commercialization plan. Um, you may see commercial strategy. You may see commercial opportunity. You may see post um, potential post application, um, different requirements, but some common themes. And I'm going to give you some of the common themes that you'll find um, in the commercialization plan. We'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so what is the commercialization plan? You know, why do they have it in there? So it, it, it's supposed to gauge economic potential. So right, economic potential is, can it attract investment? Can you sell it to clients, customers? Will, will you create sales and tax revenue and jobs, right? Um, and it's your primary opportunity to describe your strategy um, to generate revenue from the proposed project. And this is important, right? So it, 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 this gets away from a science project, right? It, it forces you to, um, to think about uh, your a business model and a revenue model. And it really is a roadmap for how you're gonna generate profits from your innovation also. So, you know, profits, revenue, um, investment, all need to be part of your commercialization plan. And it really is the genesis of a business plan, it begins to look like an investor pitch to a certain extent. So I tell clients, if you've already done a business plan or are in the process of it, or you, you have an investor pitch, a lot of times we can use a lot of that information or that, that content um, in your commercialization plan. And Lou, also just uh, you know, as a as an insight, I've seen really very very good technical proposals that have been turned down and denied specifically because they don't have a really very good commercialization plan or commercialization piece. True. Yep. Um, again, they're not classic research grants um, geared towards economic impact. And it really, it, and I see this a lot with my clients who come out of the technology area, who maybe come out of the university, maybe they're postdocs. Um, it, it really helps, it really forces a shift in the paradigm for, for these folks who are research oriented. Like if you're a researcher, this is not second nature to you and it shouldn't be, right? But this forces you to, to go out and expand your, your paradigm, your knowledge, um, find some resources to help you um, to help you in this area. And again, it's a significant weight in the scoring. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let me just go some, through some common themes here um, that you'll you'll need for your commercialization plan. And so one is language, right? So if you're an if you're if you're an entrepreneur, you you know these words. If you're not an entrepreneur, you may not know these words, and that's okay. You're not supposed to, but you know someone who who has some experience. Um, in this area can help you um, with your language. And so you wanna be able to insert some of these words in to your, into your commercialization plan. Um, you know, things like uh, MVP, um, uh, seed funding, incubators, traction, um, you know, product market fit. So th these are, and, th and then when you, when you put those terms in, then, then the light goes on. Okay, so now the, the folks on the other side, and they're judging your commercialization plan on a phase one. I mean, there's not a ton there, right? Um, but, but to have the right content with the right words really, really helps. It gives you a lot of cr more credibility. Um, discovery and validation, right? So this is a theme that I, I preach a lot on to my clients is how do you know that this is potentially has product market fit? Product market fit is the term we use for, it solves a customer's problem, customers willing to pay for um, a similar type of solution, right? So the discovery is how you go out the process and find out that stuff. And validation means I'm getting some results that help me um, feel like I, I I'm on the right track. I've got, I'm, I'm starting to validate my, my hypothesis that this technology is going to be able to be commercialized. So, you know, a lot of clients haven't done a lot of this. And so they got to do something. And, if, and, and, and there are clients that have done none of it. And they come to me at the last moment, you know, and say, hey, I'm ready to submit my proposal. I said, well, what, you know, how, what's your discovery and validation? What have you, what have you done? And, they, and even if you don't do anything, it's, good to mention it, that you understand it's important and it needs to be done. So at the very least, um, 
work it into your proposal as a, as a, as a theme. Market traction, right? So here's a, a visual of a car kind of spinning its wheels, right? I look at this technology development as a lot of wheel spinning, right? It's, it's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of energy being put in, but what traction do you have? Do you, you know, there's some letters of support that you might get from industry, but um, have you really talked to customers um, and, and are customers really excited about this? And the more, the more of that that you've got up front. And again, you're early, this is very early, but the more that you have and the more that evidence that you can present, the better off you look, you know? And, and, and you know, um, in, these, in these review panels, you're, you're competing against a panel, right? There's 10 of them or so, and eight in a review panel, and you gotta be like the best two. So you're doing everything you can to, to, to show that you, uh, that you understand um, commercialization. And, I, and here's, a, here's a, uh, a graphic that I stole. This is a Steve Blank graphic. Anybody who's done any of uh, the lean work will recognize this, but this is a revenue model. And this is very basic, right? It's like, but when it comes to research um, and, and technology, a lot of po folks don't think in these terms. What, you know, what's my revenue model? What am I gonna trade for money? How am I gonna, how am I going to monetize this? And, and there's a lot of different ways of doing this. It's not necessarily a straight up product hardware sale, right? Uh, there are different revenue models. So um, having thought through your revenue model at a very basic le level is important. If it's not there, it's kind of a red flag, right? If you don't have your revenue model in your commercialization plan. Like, so how can I, you know, how can I have confidence that you know how to commercialize your, your business if you really can't tell me how you're gonna monetize it, how you think you're gonna monetize it? Um, validated market size. So most of them ask for, tell me about the market. Give me an overview of the market. And here, there are a couple of things that are really important. Um, having some third party market research data that you can point to. Doing your own market estimates from, a, from, a, from the bottoms up is not necessarily what you need for an SBIR. Um, you need some third party market research and try to segment it down to something that's, that's uh, manageable, that fits. Um, Again, we've got resources through IBIS or other research, there are tons of market research, but in general, right, you're looking for a large market that's growing fast. Now, um, not all large markets are growing fast. Some large markets are growing not as fast, slow. That's okay. But if it's a large market growing slowly, ah, eh, okay. Now, if you're a small market and it's growing really fast, well, that's okay too, right? Now, now I'm in an exciting space. This, this could be a, a big opportunity. If I'm in a small market that's not growing very fast, that that's that becomes an issue. So um, be able to characterize the market size, the trajectory of the market, some of the dynamics around the market um, that you're selling into. And competition, um, another really, really big one, right? Um, they don't give you a lot of real estate and a lot of room sometimes, especially in the phase ones, but you have to you can't go in and say that you've got no competition, right? From an investor's perspective, that's like the kiss of death. If someone tells you they've got no competition, um, you may have something really truly unique, but you always have competition, whether it's direct or, or maybe tangential. So, um, and, and, and then a lot of times folks have not really done their due diligence to know what the, if there is competition. So again, if you say there's no competition, you're either, you're either um, just blind or you know, or you're just really um, haven't done your homework. And then the last thing here is um, follow-on equity funding, and I talked about this as a commercialization strategy. Um, knowing that you've got to go out and raise uh, uh, private funds is an important piece, and just knowing that you need to do that and acknowledging it is half the battle. Um, you know, if you're going to go from a phase one and you're going to go and, and you say you're going to hit a, you know, you're going to apply to venture capital, you're going to work with venture capitalists for a $5 million raise to commercialize this. Well, that's not necessarily realistic. You know, knowing the difference between when venture capitalists are important and when they're, when they're, uh, when you need a venture capitalist or when you're ready for one and maybe an angel investor is, um, is critical. Um, and if you, you know, if you think that your next step might be angel investment, well, then, then list, 
list who the angel investors, the groups are in your particular area and how you might engage them, or if you've talked to them already at some point, or if you know maybe you're already engaged with them. So that this is an important piece, the follow on equity funding. You know, a lot of people just get, it's usually last, and a lot of people just kind of like stop um, when they get here and just don't know really what to do. Well, we do have a, another question, sorry, from um, Michelle sure, Cochran. She says, what if you are a small business in a large industry where the large corporations are starting to notice and invade the space? Can you pitch for funds based on needing to expand to continue to compete? Yeah, of course. You know, large corporations, um, that kind of validates your space, right? It, it, if, they're, if they're investing and they're active, um, that's that's always a good sign. Now the you know the flip side is you know how are you going to compete? How are you going to differentiate? And that could be hard because you know in having worked for large corporations in the venture space, right? You don't really know what's behind the curtain. You don't really know what they're doing uh, inside of the court. They don't necessarily have to tell you. They don't have to disclose, and they don't necessarily publish it. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know. Um, and also, you know, I will tell you, having worked both sides, smaller businesses and larger businesses, you know, large corporations can develop some really, really good stuff, but they're slow and they're clumsy and um, good, nimble startups, small companies that are very laser focused, very efficient, can, can compete very, very well in these spaces. Bob, do you have anything on that? Mm -hmm. The other thing too is that <clears throat> there may be times that as you're doing your phase two, that ultimately your client's gonna be one of these large companies that's gonna take notice of what you're doing and come in and give you the pot of gold to purchase you know, your product, your process, your application, because they see the potential for that to be uh, a large revenue generator. And, you know, as a, as a SBIR, you know, SBIR applicant and awardee, you may not want that, but that may be part of your ultimate exit strategy is that, you know, yeah, we're going to sell out to Johnson and Johnson for a lot of money. Um, so you've got to think about that also as you're doing your commercialization, commercialization piece. But the other thing too, is that you can't ask for SBIR funds for you know, for that particular part of your SBIR, that's usually not part of your SBIR um, award is to, is to combat, you know, those kind of people that may be interested in what you're doing. So you got to think about that, you know, and, and like I said, one of the biggest failures I see is people that don't do marketing like you just previously said and don't have a good commercialization piece. Yeah, thanks, Bob. That's that's important. I'll just add a little more. Having worked in this space, um, you know, on the acquisition side, again, having a lot of experience, you know, um, internally in these large organizations, they could do they they feel they can pretty much do anything that anybody else can do. It just becomes sometimes a um, a, a a matter of resource prioritization, right? You've got so many things that you could do. What are you doing? Um, and it just, it's sometimes it's just cheaper and faster and better to, to buy the technology rather than develop it yourself. You just get there quicker, especially if it's, uh, if it's solid. So, um, just a little more on like a phase one commercialization plan, the lengths, like, uh, on the uh, NSF, it's two to four pages. I always suggest that you, that you do four pages because there's a, a lot to cover. Commercialization plan for DOE is two pages, and these are phase ones. So, um, you know, uh, for the DOD, it's it's one page, right? And one of the things about commercialization, commercialization um, with the I'm going to talk about NASA, who's a procuring agency. My experience is they were very they're very interested in other commercial applications for the technology outside of the DOD, or outside of their I'm sorry, outside of the procuring agency. Because if you think about it. Um, more, uh, if the technology can be commercialized in the, in the open market, all the costs borne for development um, and productization can be shared over um, a much larger uh, a base. Uh, and so the, the, the procuring agency gets the benefit of, of, um, of the broader commercialization. Bob, you have any, any comment there? 
Uh huh. Uh, same thing, you know. I mean, with with NASA, I have an awardee who I can't talk to you about what their product is because of the NDA, but they have a, 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 an award that's specific for NASA, but then also is readily transferable to commercial satellites. I mean, without going into too much detail. So, so they're really looking at this particular awardee. Um, uh, getting you know business from NASA, but also getting business from commercial satellite uh, uh, companies. Good, good example. Yeah. Um, on a on a phase two, and I'm just going to give you an example for National Science Foundation because this is what I'm more familiar with. The commercialization plan can exceed 15 pages, and when these guys again, when they say like two to four pages or two page or one page, that means that's a hard stop, right? You just you don't go over the limit. You just you stick to the page limit. No matter how interesting content you've got, you've got to stick to the page limit. So commercialization plan, 15 pages for the NSF, excluding the letters of support. And again, it think, talks about market opportunity, the company, the team, product technology and competition. Again, a very customer centric, that's a customer centric view about validation and discovery. Um, and then and then it asks you, you know, phase ones typically don't ask you for it, but Phase two will ask you for sales forecast, revenue model, um, and for you know for pro formers for you know two years in the phase two effort, and then three years for the commercialization effort post phase two. And a lot of folks who are in this space, and if it's their first entree into business, are really really uncomfortable um, doing a financial forecast because um, it's it's highly uncertain, and they say, "How can I predict the future?" And, and one of the things we know about forecasts is they're wrong, right? Just from the start. So, um, but be able to, to do an intelligent forecast, to do it intelligently have, and have it thought through um, and, and being optimistic about the forecast and not overly optimistic, but realistically optimistic um, is, is important part of the uh, part of the commercialization plan. So again, this starts to look like a, like a business plan, right? A mini business plan. And again, you can, bring some of your business plan information in if you've got it already. Um, again, so sbir.gov, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some resources here and I, I like this website and I, Bob, I'm gonna have you weigh in on it, but um, you know, I, I'm kind of critical of the government. I'm kind of a private sector guy. I could be pretty critical about some of the bureaucracy and whatnot, but when it comes down to how they did this site, um, I, I really think it, it's very beneficial. Um, for folks who are interested in SBIRs and want to get started. And, you know, there's there's online tutorials. There's 55 courses, including agency overviews, program basics, data rights, IP protections, you name it. You can find it. There's different formats. There's audio video. There's multimedia. There's a PDF. Um, I really like it. A lot of my clients spend a lot of time here before they see me. Bob, you have any, any comment here? Yeah. Same thing. This is a good place to start at, S at the SBIR, SBIR.gov. It, it's, it's sort of your gateway um, into SBIRs. And there are a lot of tutorials. And when I work with clients, if I think a client has a weak area, I'll go ahead and send to them a specific tutorial on a, on a specific topic or application portal or how an application portal works. So, you know, um, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of work that goes into applying to an SBIR. I always tell my clients, don't start doing an SBIR 30 days before it's due because it's a lot of work. I usually like a client to start their SBIR application two to three months before it's due. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's important. I, 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 I couldn't overemphasize that. It's, it's a major investment in time and effort um, for, um, for business to apply. Now there's upside, but it, it is a big investment on your own, on your, on your part. And remember, this is a very, very competitive process. Um, you know, the, the Air Force SBIR program that closed a couple of months ago had 1,300 applications. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. What is the win rate usually? Is it, is it <clears throat> once they get, are they accepted? Is it about 20%, 10, 20%? No, it really depends on where you're going. With National Science Foundation, the award rate was 10%. So 90% of the applicants that, uh, that applied for NSF failed. Now with the Air Force Works program, they award a lot of their, what they call beginning 
you know, small bites, they call it, you know, they're, they're $50,000 awards. And, and that's such a specific program that I don't want to get into it too much in detail. But then when you get to their phase two, you know, it's, it's it more like a 20%. So it really depends from agency to agency to agency. National Science Foundation is incredibly competitive. Very, 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 very competitive. Um, so it depends on where you're applying. I think an NSF, it is competitive on the phase ones, but I think when you get to a phase two, I think if you're invited, because they invite you, I, yes. think it's, I think it's 50% or so. I yes. think your odds go way up. It is. That's exactly right. Your, your odds go you know, way, way up. The other thing, too, about NSF is, remember, you have to turn in a pitch paper and True. be invited to apply. You, know, right. you can't just apply. That's true. That's another subtlety for NSF. Mm -hmm. So on the resource side, again, I gave you the website to look at. Um, and then there's Bob and I, right? I'm an SBDC advisor. Bob's a PTAC advisor. Um, it's not necessarily either or. Um, mm -hmm. You can work with, we both work together. We actually have complementary skill sets when it comes down to this. So we can contact either of us to start the process and uh, we, can, we can get you going. Um, you know, quite often I'll, I'll, I'll uh, refer out um, clients who want external consultants. There are good external consultants. Some are very expensive. Some are more reasonable. They'll hold your hand. They'll, they'll help write your proposal for you. Um, and there are clients that I have that have the funding to, to do this. And, um, you know, we've got, I've got a referral list. I know, Bob, you've got some folks too. I do. That we work with. So we're happy to, we're happy to refer them out. Um, if, if you need, if you need that and, you know, the cost I, I, you know, I come across as anywhere from two to 8,000. Does that sound right to you, Bob? Yeah, that's about right. That's yeah. about right in the ballpark, depending on what you're asking the consultant to do. The other thing too, is, you know, just like Lou said, you know, it, it's not a, either you contact Lou or contact me. There, there are a number of times where I get clients and I send their commercialization piece up to Lou because, you know, honestly, he's better at looking at that than I am. And then we've got we got one more SBDC advisor in my group, um, uh, a guy named Tom Fulcher, who has experience also. So he's a, he's another resource. What you'll find is there, you know, there this is kind of a nuanced program. There are not a lot of people that really know this or understand this in the in the state in our state at least. And so um, if you can find somebody that can help you, um, you should um, get the help that you can. Um, the other the other. Uh, and I'll speak from an ASU perspective, university resources, right? So there, you know, and I work with ASU a lot, a lot but there's no centralized university SBAR ASU resource. Like you can't just go to this department for help. However, if you're connected into the university and you know people in the university, there are clusters of researchers that have done SBIRs before. And if you're some way related or you can tap that, that is something that um, those are invaluable resources. They can really, really help. We've got lots of experience. Um, Bob, on, on the U of A side? On the U of A side, it is a little bit different. The University of Arizona does have a Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation, or actually it's called the Center for Innovation. And they deal specifically with SBIRs. And if you, you know, wanna get in contact with them, you can contact me or you can contact them directly. Same thing with Gateway Community College. It's a community college, but they have a center for, an entre for entrepreneurial innovation. And I get a, um, a large number of referrals for them. The other thing I wanted to say is I'm not located up in Phoenix. I'm located down here in Cochise County, which is kind of the edge of the earth, but um, I cover the entire state for SBIRs for PTAC. Um, so, you know, I'm sort of the designated subject matter expert that any that comes, um, anybody that goes through uh, Arizona PTAC or actually Gateway College, you know, they usually refer them to me. Um, I, I guess I went to a course one time a long time ago and then they said, oh, now you're the subject matter expert. So, yeah. And I've been doing SBIRs now for probably about four or five years. Okay, great. Um... And, and then on the university side, also at ASU, a lot of times if you need a partner, um, we, I've got contacts over there, some services, there's some folks over there that can help that you may make the contacts you need if you're looking for a, um, a particular um, research partner. ASU, you know, U of A is, big, is a big organization. ASU is a massive organization. 
and trying to find the needle in the haystack sometimes really difficult. Although, you know, I've had clients successfully go through the, um, the research directory um, to find, you know, to search on research topics with these um, and come up with professors and, and email directly and, and, and be able to contact them that way. But we've got somebody also over there that can help at least direct traffic and help make those connections. And then the other, you know, they're a really good source of, of uh, um, information and guidance are winners. Honestly, there's no substitute for folks that have done this before. You know, usually if you've won, you've lost. Um, you know, you've, you've not been selected, a lot of lessons learned. Um, and if you know any winners that are willing to help you, that's, um, I would approach them and see if they will. I mean, it is highly competitive. Uh, a lot of times that, you know, it's just not real open with, with sharing information, but there are some folks that will. And so uh, I would definitely um, seek those folks out. So, so Lou, I also wanted to let you know that Tom Fulcher, one of our other SBDC business analysts put um, just a comment in the chat. And he said he has a client getting their second phase two and they're moving to investors for matching funds that may increase the SBIR amounts. Yep, thank you, Tom. And that, and that was Tom Fulcher, the one I, I mentioned that um, also has SBIR experience. The, um, yeah, it's phase twos, and again, another subtlety, some of the, some of the agencies have matching programs, matching funds. So. Um, if you go out post phase two, uh, supplemental, I think it's called sometimes, uh, if you get, um, go to investors and, and you, it, they'll match the funds. So the, the agency, you go out and get half a million from investors, they'll come in with another half million. That becomes really attractive to investors, really, really attractive, right? So now I've got, I'm doubling essentially my, um, yeah, the money going into the, uh, into the venture. Okay, so I've, I've talked a lot. Any more questions? I've got a couple other slides, some basic slides to talk about what's going on here at the at the uh, SBDC. But no, we don't have any more questions. I'm just going to repost on um, how people, which I know you're going to talk about, how people can register for counseling um, for our site for the Maricopa SBDC, as well as where people can look at our future events. So I'm putting those in the chat. Um, you know, and one of the things I think we forgot to put in. Can you put the link, the the PTAC link in also? Sure. Sure. Yeah. No problem. Yep. To make sure folks have it, I don't know if it's on this deck. Yeah, okay, and I we, didn't. I didn't put it in. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. And we just actually just got a hot off the press. Another question: Can you resubmit application if you are selected the first time? If so, is there a limit on the number of times you can apply? Uh, Go ahead, Bob. Let me let me ask this. So, if you said if you can resubmit an application if you got an award the first time. The answer is no, you cannot apply, you know, if you've got an award for a specific project, you can't apply, you cannot apply to another agency um, for that same kind of project. You, 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 once you get your award, that's your award. Now, what I do talk to clients about is you can do multiple initial applications. In other words, if you've got, if you apply to NSF for a project, you can also apply if it's you know a designated topic area to NIH for that topic or DOD if it's a DOD application. So you can have multiple applications in for a phase one, but once you get that phase one, you can't apply, cannot apply again to another agency for the same topic. And in addition, it, I, I, I think on most of the proposals, the solicitations, they ask if you've been awarded You've got to disclose if you've been awarded yes. previous and to who, who awarded you, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, the other thing, too, that I wanted to, you know, point out is sometimes clients that get phase one say, you know, are in their application for phase one, they say, well, when do I start applying for phase two? And I tell them the day you get your phase one is the day that you start, you know, your application for phase two. You may not be turning it in, but you need to start thinking immediately about that phase two application as opposed to waiting to the end of your phase one to, you know, start to start, you know, your sort of intellectual thought process for your phase two. Any more questions? So, you know, I'm sure there, there will be questions that come up as, as you think about this. And again, you got Bob and I's um, information. This, this will be um, posted on our website. Um, 
just reach out and we can we can we can work with you. So I'm going to move on here, Donna. So oh yeah, so here's good good segue. So for the SBDC, um, Maricopa, go to this uh, link. Uh, typically, and you sign up, you you need to register as Bob mentioned. Um, just like BTAC, you need to be registered as a client uh, for uh, to be um, an SBDC counselor uh, to get SBDC services. Um, we do an initial counseling session. That's you know where we sit down and we kind of get to know what you're doing. With SBRs, the follow-on sessions are usually you know review. Um, uh, but in in normal business course of business, we do you know we work continually with our with our clients. We track some business goals. And again, our counseling is by appointment only. Same thing with us. Our, our counseling is by appointment only. You have to go ahead and get registered, you know, as a client. Oh, okay. Here's more. Okay. So, oh, some upcoming webinars. Uh, next week, we've got Buying a Business, April 14th uh, from 10 to 11 a.m. We've got a subject matter expert. Uh, business broker who works for the SBDC now is, is going to uh, present. Um, I'm actually doing an angel investing um, uh, webinar. And some of you may have been on some of my previous ones. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how what the pandemic has done, um, how it's created some new opportunities for folks. Um, really exciting. We've got digital marketing series. We've got, we've hired a, a, an expert in digital marketing. He's going to talk about video and, and geoimaging on April 28th. Um, and then we've got a, a series of, they're called the Great Marketing Turnaround. There's a first session. This is, runs, I think there's two or three sessions. They run in series. Um, and it's more of a workshop, hands-on workshop. We're actually doing some of the, of the, um, the marketing work using uh, the template and being guided by one of our uh, highly skilled um, uh, counselors. Okay, so here's our website. You got there's COVID resources, there's a training event calendar. So if you you know go to this go to this website, you'll see our calendar. There's a bunch of uh, there's more webinars on there than I I, I let um, that I specified. I know we've got some IP ones coming up here too, intellectual property. Um, you can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Stay current. Um, and again, thank you for joining one, us today. One go ahead, Bob. Part. One other quick thing that I wanted to throw out to, to, you know, the folks that are still there. Sometimes, you know, you may not have a really very good SBIR application, <clears throat> but as a PTAC counselor, I look at what you do and there's a lot of ways to skin the cat, you know, with the federal government, um, particularly with DOD, you know, there sometimes are agencies that are going to be directly interested in what you're doing, even though it's not an SBIR application. And so, you know, as a, as a PTAC counselor, you know, I reach out and touch a lot, a lot of federal contracting officers. And if I see something that I think is really very interesting, I may put you directly in touch with contracting officer. Um, I have somebody who has just gotten an order for 100,000 of his units that originally started off, you know, looking at SBIRs and it wasn't an SBIR application. I put him directly in contact with uh, Navy contracting officer. They got very interested in what he was doing. They invited him to um, a vendor uh, uh, conference and, you know, his product now is taken off. So, you know, I may tell you that you don't have a good SBIR application, but there's other ways that, you know, you may want to uh, look at getting funding. So not everything is an SBIR, but then again, not everything is, you know, um, not in, of interest to the government. Thank you, Bob. That's important. And, and the SBDC, we don't really do any government contracting. We don't do it at all. And so, you know, PTAC and Bob and his staff are our go-to for, for all of that. Um, and um, from a grant perspective, we really don't do many grants either here at the SBDC, but the SBIR has, happens to be a specialized uh, um, topic. So Donna, you've got an evaluation survey. Yeah, uh, once this is over, we, uh, the, we you guys will receive an evaluation survey automatically. So we'd appreciate you filling that out and letting us know if we met your needs and what other future kind of um, uh, offerings you'd like to see. 
Um, we will also be sending you a link um, of this recording. We post it on our website. It's also posted on our network YouTube channel. So everyone that has registered will receive the link to view the recording. And um, like Lou said, just keep checking our events um, webinar. We are now uh, publishing the events for May. We have, like he said, intellectual property. We also have an export uh, webinar coming up. So um, we thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you in the future. <laughs>